on, come on. He's an awesome God. He's an awesome God. He's the only one who can, amen. Woo! While you're standing right now, keep your hands clapping, because let's welcome every single one of our campuses today. Arrowhead, we love you. Pomona, we love you. Welcome. Africa over there, come on now. Tijuana, Mexico. Gloria a Dios. Hallelujah. Woo! Come on now. AZ, we love you too. Everybody out there. And of course, Pastor Gabriel and all the people who are watching in their homes doing watch parties. Love you. Bam, I called you out. Pastor Gabriel, stop complaining about it from now on because I just did it. Amen. God bless. Everybody sit down. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Pastor Gabriel, right? Man, y'all never ever talk about us over here or me or anything. I'm joking. He's literally never said that. But he's like my brother, so I get to, you know, play around a little bit. Um, welcome to church today on this incredible Sunday. Are you comfortable? Is everybody good? Feeling good? Wasn't praise and worship powerful today? Awesome. So as we are figuring out the light situation, just know if you can't see me, you can still hear me. I'm here. So um, if you were not here last Wednesday, this is part two of that message. Wednesday, I had talked about breaking the poverty curse. You see, we defined poverty on Wednesday, and we also defined curses. Curses are like a taboo word for Christians because it seems like, what are you talking about curses? Like, what? Like, when I got saved, there are no curses. Well, the truth actually is, Galatians 3 says that Jesus became the curse. He became the curse on the cross so that you and I would not have to bear the curse. However, just because Jesus paid for it doesn't mean that you've taken the withdrawal. We talked about how Jesus makes things available. The Bible says in Ephesians, all the spiritual blessings are now yours in Christ. The Bible talks about that you've been transferred out of darkness into this marvelous light. But just because it's in the bank for you and you now have an inheritance, positionally, you are free. Positionally, you do have peace. Positionally, you are prosperous. However, it doesn't mean you can feel any of those things actually in your life. Because if you do not withdraw and apply, you don't get it. So just because Jesus has an incredible inheritance doesn't mean that we are accessing it. We actually have to possess what is ours. There's a huge difference between it, you have it, it's yours, and saying, I'm going in now. I'm not settling for what I am in my life. I'm actually going to have the joy God promised. I am taking it by faith. And I'm walking in it. There's a difference between saying, you know, I've heard that God paid for my sickness, but I'm not feeling healthy. And now I'm going in and I am possessing health supernaturally by taking it from the place and the enemy who wants to sit in my land, get off of my land, get off of my children, get away from my family. I'm possessing what Jesus has already given me. There's a difference. We talked about that. We broke it down. And then we talked about how curses come and how curses are broken. Some people are living under a curse or what you could say the consequences of something they didn't even do but happened generations before you and you're still living under it. Because some of, one of the attributes of a curse that we talked about is that it goes on for generations until somebody sees it, recognizes it, and cuts it off at the roots. One young man who heard the message on Wednesday actually went and he prayed the prayer at the end and he said, I'm just going to believe something's going on. And when he prayed, God showed him a vision. He took him back hundreds of years and he showed him the moment that poverty entered his family line. And he, Jesus was on the other side and saying, now I'm here. I became the curse. You now have brokenness from your family for the rest of your life. What an incredible message. He was crying, weeping. It was happening. So it was an incredible time. Please watch that message. We talked about what poverty is. We talked about how insufficiency is lack. It means, for instance, we gave the example. If you go to the grocery store, if you want to talk resources wise, and you need $10 to buy groceries, but you have $9.90, it is insufficient. Efficient. You came up short. But if you have $10, you had exactly what you needed. See, this is how it is with Christians a lot in life. Because they believe that they're not supposed to succeed. They're used to failure. They're used to lack in their life. Jesus said, the Lord is my shepherd. David said, I shall not, 
I shall not be in lack is the word. The Lord literally is my shepherd. I shall not be in lack. So some of y'all, you arrive to a place and somebody's sick and you said, man, I wish I could lay hands on them and get healed. But you come up short. You don't have the faith you need in order to get the job done. So you go and get the pastor to do it. Or you go and get the evangelist to do it. You're coming up short. You wish you had words of wisdom. You wish that, man, that person, he needs some help. He's, he's really in a confusing situation. Man, I wish I had the words that I could like speak into that situation. I wish I was that kind of person, but that's just not me. I've never been that kind of person ever. You're coming up short because of what you believe because of what you've been going, because of how you've been living. But there are people who believe that what they need, they'll have it the moment they need it. There are people who know that in the moment that I speak, remember Jesus told his disciples, he said, when you walk out and you go to these cities and you go to these towns, he said, don't worry about what you need to say. The moment that you come before him, if you'll just open your mouth, I'll put on your mouth the words you need to say the moment that you need to say them. So there is something that happens that literally the moment you need it, you got it. The moment you need that healing power, you got it. The moment you need the word of wisdom, you got it. The moment you need the clarity, that is the life God wants. But we haven't even talked about abundance yet. We're still just talking about having your needs, but Jesus doesn't give you enough for your needs. He always has 12 baskets left over. So now, instead of just saying, you know what, uh, you got what you need, now you are living a life of health. You have supernatural health. Sickness is not visiting your house. You're saying, forget you. If it visits, it's there for a couple days and it's gone. You're not living in health. Your diseases are broken. Now it's time that Jesus says, now that you're healthy, let's go give you a healing ministry. Let's go see you lay hands on somebody else. Let's go see you see and put somebody else. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you got the clarity you need. Do you know how many confused people there are in the body of Christ? He says, now you got clarity. Let me give you wisdom for people. Let me give you wisdom for jobs. Let me give you some mentors. Let me give you some disciples. Let me give you some people who you can help. You see, now you're going beyond yourself. Please watch Wednesday. It will be good for you. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. Let's get into the word today. Are you ready? Man, this message today, y'all, if you listen to it with faith, Jesus said these words. He said that there was a group of people they heard the word, but because it was not mixed with faith, it profited them nothing. I'm going to give you God's word. I will never give you my opinion. Can I just make that promise to you? I'm not here at the Way World Outreach, my family and I. We did not come from Atlanta, Georgia, so that I could give you my good opinions. I'm here to give you God's word because it's the only thing that God will bless. It's the only thing the Holy Spirit will confirm. He does not confirm your opinions and it doesn't matter how passionate you are about your opinions. He only confirms his word. You can whisper his word and you'll get more reaction by whispering his word than screaming your own opinions trying to convince people. So let's just talk about the word today. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you are recognizing more clearly the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, his astonishing kindness, his generosity, come on, amen, his gracious favor, that though he was rich, let's pause there, Jesus was not poor, y'all. We broke that down on Wednesday as well. There was no time that Jesus was poor. The moment he became poor, this scripture says, yet for your sake he became poor. When? When he was on the cross. Before then, he was not poor. <laughs> so then he became poor. Why did he do that? So that you, by his poverty, might become abundantly blessed. I'm going to read that again. For your sake, Jesus on the cross became poor. I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about every form of lack in your life. Prosperity is not just financial. Prosperity is mental. Prosperity is your soul. Prosperity is your relationships. Prosperity is your health. He's saying in every area now that you lack, he became all that lack is. He became the fullness of what lack could do. We actually looked and saw that 2 Corinthians says, and Deuteronomy says as well in Deuteronomy 28, that poverty is defined as this, thirsty, hungry, naked, owning nothing. That is poverty. It's four ways. Thirsty, hungry, naked, owning nothing. Jesus, when he went to the cross, he said, I am hungry. He had not eaten for 24 hours. Jesus, when he was on the cross, said, I am thirsty. Please, he thirsted. Jesus, when he was on the cross, was on there naked. They took his clothes from him. And Jesus didn't own anything to the point that they had to bury him in a borrowed tomb. He became the fullness of lack so that you and I could have the fullness of the abundant blessed life. That's something to worship God for. 
So that's why we get to talk about the blessing. It's all because of Jesus. It's not because of you. Do you understand that you don't get to get blessed because of what you did? I promise you we're not talking about anything you deserve, but Jesus deserves it. And because now you're found in Christ, you get what he gets. Do you understand that? You get to have what Jesus paid for, even though you don't deserve it. That's the good news. That's the blessing. That's why we should be coming to church saying, oh man, what's God doing unveiling me today? It's an exciting life because God has blessings he wants to give you all the time. Not because you deserve them. You got to get that out of your mind. It's because he loves you so much. His cross paid for you to have it and now he wants you to get it okay john 10 10 let's read what this says the thief comes what does he come to do only in order to steal to kill and to destroy let me just tell you this the devil will never come to you one day and say you know what <laughs> i've been hard on you haven't i you know let's just take today off you know i just want to encourage you for a little while <laughs> As unlikely is it as it is that the devil would ever come and encourage you is as unlikely it would be that Jesus would ever come to discourage you that Jesus would ever come to depress you that Jesus would ever come and try to make you poor the Bible says the devil comes to steal kill and destroy but I came come on everybody said I came say it again I came that you might have life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows my god of heaven you see david said the lord is my shepherd i shall not be in what and he's saying all these scriptures incredible songs but then he says this he says that the lord feels he touches he anoints my head with oil my cup overflows so what is david saying he's saying that there's a place you can get at in your life as a believer where you're no longer drinking from your own cup you're drinking from the overflow and the cup actually belongs to everyone else That kind of a life, if you're living the life where you're still paycheck to paycheck, just hoping you're getting by, that is not the best abundance God wants for you. If you're living a life and you're just hoping you make it in the morning, you walk out of bed and you're like, Lord, just get me through this day. God will help you. But I just want you to know that's not all the abundant life has for you. If you're just trying to get through the end of this year and you're like, Lord, if I just don't kill everybody around me, then I'll just stay safe. Please, God, just get me through. I understand that's real sometimes. I understand some people, put, but that's not the abundant life. I just want you to know it does get better than that. It's greater than that. You do not have to stay depressed for the rest to your life if you don't want to you don't have to i just want you to know there is another option there is an abundant full overflowing life that jesus already paid for in other words it's in your bank account it's waiting for you to make a withdrawal it's already there mm, is anybody hearing me today there's something that God wants for you. There's a gift that's already he put inside of you that you didn't even know about yet. There are multiple gifts that are inside of you that are trying to come out. There are things that God's trying to get to you right now that everything in the world is trying to stop you from getting. But you know what? He's already cleared the path because the cross cleared the path so that all the blessings could come to you. So the real question is, how powerful do you think the cross is? That's the question. How, whatever your perception is of the level of power of the cross is how much you are receiving right now. Because the cross in its power didn't just silence the enemy. Please understand, Jesus went down into hell itself. And Colossians says these words. It says that he went and he embarrassed every principality. He embarrassed every single principality of darkness. He embarrassed every demon. The Bible said that he literally took them in chains and he walked them around in a procession. Can you imagine coming to the home field of somebody else's field and walking in there and being like, get over here, chaining them all up in front of their own home field and embarrassing them by walking them around? That's what Jesus did to suicide that's what Jesus did to depression that's what Jesus did to hopelessness that's what Jesus did he took them around he literally went into hell and he said what you got on me hell where is your sting what do you got let me walk you around it says that they were not it says that he was not their slaves it says they were his Whew. the things that are making you drown right now Jesus chained up and laughed at the things that you drowned on, Jesus walks on top of. The cross made the way 
So the only thing that is stopping it from coming your direction is you. Do you remember what Jesus said when he hit the cross? Do you remember that at the very end before he gave up his spirit? It is. What is he saying? He's saying my part's done. A thousand years ago, my part is done. You know how many conferences I've been to? And you know what we're praying? Crying out to God. Lord, if you just come, God. We're waiting on you. Nah, 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 nah. We're not waiting on Jesus anymore. It is finished. He did his part. He's waiting on us to believe. He's waiting on us to get an agreement. He's waiting on us to apply a principle. <laughs> Jesus has given us the ability and the privilege to have an abundant life, but it doesn't mean you have to have it. He will not force you. So when we talk about abundance, here's the definition. Having more than enough for your own needs, giving one the ability to now meet the needs of others beyond themselves. God's mouth is way too big for when he speaks to you, he's only speaking to you. Have you ever thought about the fact that God's mouth is so big that when he gives you a word, Yes, it was meant to touch and heal you, but it was supposed to sprout into something else so you could take that and heal others. God is always speaking beyond you. Whenever he speaks a word, it's big enough for you and everyone that you're connected to. Whenever he gives you a breakthrough, it's big enough for you to have a breakthrough, but it's also a good enough breakthrough to empower you to break through with your family, to break through with your friends. To break. He's always going beyond us. It's always beyond us. It's never just about us. He loves us and he does it for us, but it's beyond us. Dictionary definition of abundance is having in large amounts. Can I just say something? There is nothing small about being a Christian. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Well, you know, we're just going to like live in our neighborhood and, um, you know, try to just get along with all of our neighbors. And, you know, we're going to like, you know, we'll take them a little cookie here and there. And hopefully we won't have any arguments and our kids will stay quiet so we don't annoy anybody around us. And, you know, we do go to church and maybe one of these days I'll be able to tell them about the gospel if they come over for a barbecue, maybe next year, one time in the year or something. And th There is nothing small about being a Christian. The Bible says that when the disciples came into town, everyone knew what they were doing. And they said, stop these men who are coming. Don't let them get into our city because these are the men who turn the world upside down. This means that everywhere you're going... It's not because of how cool you are, but it's because of the bigness of Jesus that you have let out on the inside of you by surrendering that all of a sudden he's affecting everyone around you. It's an exciting life. It's not a boring life. It's not a life where you're, you're most Christians are more busy just trying to get out of their sinful habit patterns that they're literally never even starting what Christianity is all about. Paul talks to the Corinthian church and he says, you still haven't left all your old idols. I've been talking to you for a long time, and we're still talking about this. you got to leave all your old girlfriends behind. You haven't left all your old lovers. He's like, what? Like, I'm ready to talk to you about stuff about moving things and changing people's lives and, and going and having a purpose to your life and having joy and your family being touched and all this, but i got to still come back here? Jesus has a way bigger life, y'all. You're not supposed to be living in shame as a Christian and guilt. You're beating yourself up every single day. And now when every time you get to the worship service, you're just in confession, repenting the entire time worship happens. Is that the depth of your worship? You're in a place you're like, man, I just got to repent this entire time. Because you feel so guilty of what you did all week. God has a great life for y'all. God wants you to move past. He wants to move on with your future. He's ready to get going. But when we talk about abundance... There is often a misconception. Some people, when we talk about the word prosperity, it might be rubbing you the wrong way. Like even some of y'all, when we say prosperity, you're cringing on the inside. Because maybe if you've been in church for a long time, there are certain circles and certain places that have truly abused abundance. They have abused prosperity. It's been about the amount of cars you have. <clears throat> it's been about the amount of houses that you have. It's been about the people that you know, all the connections you got, whether or not you can walk into a place and you got that Rolex or you got that thing. I just want you to know... I'm not about that gospel. 
I'm trying to preach you the gospel. I'm going to give you the Bible. However, listen, abundance, this is the first thing you need to know before we continue. The level of abundance is made custom to fit your individual calling. Let me say that again. The level of abundance for your life is custom fitted for your individual calling. So it will be different for people. Let me tell you what I mean. Solomon was a king. He was the king of Israel. The Bible said that there will be no man who was as rich as Solomon was and no man that will ever be as rich as he is until the end of time. That means he was in the trillions, y'all, what they're estimating, not the billions, the trillions for one man. He had entire cities that were dedicated to his horses. Okay? He had palaces that were literally dedicated just for his servants who served wine. They had their own palaces. And being the smartest man in the world, he did the stupidest thing in the world by marrying 700 wives and 300 concubines. Have you ever thought about that? The man who wrote the book of Proverbs, the wisest ever, a thousand women, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard in my life. <laughs> what are you doing, man? Anyway, right? But this man, and the reason why he got it is because he went to the Lord and in a dream, God comes to him and he says, what can I give you? Anything you ask, I'll give you. And he doesn't ask for money and he doesn't ask for wealth. He says, give me wisdom in order to deal with your people. Help me, Lord, have discernment. And God says, because you didn't ask for these things and you asked not on your own behalf, but you asked on the behalf of someone else, he said, I'm going to give you that wisdom more than anybody's ever had, but I'm also going to give you riches that you've never ever had before. And so... He's a king. Can I just say, most of us in here, I think probably almost all of us are not destined to be the king of the nation of America. If there's a president in here, God bless. Maybe there is. Who knows? But honestly, so for an evangelist, if you're called to be that, you should not expect that you'll have cities for your horses. Let's just be honest, right? I'm trying, to, I'm trying to just break down some common thoughts here because we compare ourselves to other people and think that because their abundance should be our abundance, we have nothing. And you're looking at people who are like presidents. You're looking at kings of nations. You're looking at men of God who've been like men of God for like 50 years, walking with God, been promoted. They didn't start that way, but now they're 50 years later, they're that way. And you're sitting there, man, I'm doing nothing for God. I got nothing. God doesn't want to bless me. But don't compare yourself. To anyone else can we just start there stop comparing what you have to somebody else's before we even enter into abundance please understand what you were personally called to do God has attached to it the exact level that you're gonna need okay let's watch what the Bible defines as abundance because I don't want to tell you anything in any other opinion the Bible defines what every single Christian can expect and have faith for I want to arise your faith and spark it today because every single Christian has a level of abundance they should be believing for and it's in the Bible. Are you ready for this? You ready to hear what God thinks you should be having and believing for right now? All right? Number one. <laughs> I love this. Oh, this is so exciting. Romans 13, 7 through 8. Give to everyone what you owe them. Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them and give respect and honor to those who are in authority. Listen to these words. Owe nothing to anyone except for your obligation to love one another. If you love your neighbor, you will fulfill the requirements of the law. One more scripture, Proverbs 22, verse 7. The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is slave to the lender. Do you believe Jesus rescued you to become a slave? then every single person under the sound of my voice should be out of all debt. You didn't hear what I just said. I'm talking, I need somebody with faith right here. God just said, if you are in debt, you should get up to your feet right now. You should put your hands in the air. Every single person who is in serious debt right now, it is not God's will for you. I understand maybe it was your fault. I understand maybe it was a student loan. I understand, I don't know what it was, but God's will is that you come out. Come on now, come on, praise him for it. Stand up, Say, hands in the air, hands in the air right now. If you are under debt, I need your hands in the air right now because there is an anointing. It was there in the 9 o'clock and it's coming right now. There is an anointing to break debt. This is not God's will for your life. 
I don't care if it's 200,000. I don't care if it's half a million. I don't care how much it is. Remember, God is not providing for you according to your riches and glory. He's providing for you according to his bank account. It's not yours, it's his. God does not want you owing anybody. You are not meant to be a slave. You've had enough anxiety over money. Your marriage has taken enough fear and anxiety because of money. Your personal life has taken enough fear and anxiety over money. Look at all these people believing for a breakthrough. This is important to God. He doesn't want you owing anybody. He did not save you doing all that he did, going through all the temptations to die on the cross so that you can now be a slave to money. But the borrower is slave to the lender. You know what it feels like. You know how horrible it feels to owe somebody every day you wake up? You know how horrible it feels to not be able to make the plans you want because you owe this? You know how horrible it feels? This is not God's will. And we're only at step one of what abundance is. But lift your hands right now. Holy Spirit of God. Do you trust him to be your provider? Do you trust him? He wants to lead you out. Thank you, God, for your goodness. Jesus, we just thank you, Lord, that you're doing something right now. That the anointing is here to break a yoke of bondage. And that yoke of bondage is the doubt and unbelief in these people's hearts. I thank you removing it. I thank you that faith would be coming together. I am asking you to reach out your faith. I'm asking you to believe again that God wants you not to be a slave to anything or anyone. But whom the Son sets free is truly set free indeed. Not just spiritually, but in every area. If you had fault in this, if you had bad decision, I want you to repent of that. It's okay. God already knows about it. It's time for you to move on. He wants to help you. I've seen thousands of people in the last 20 years come out of debt miraculously. Miraculously. Because they dedicated to obey God's principles and they repented. Just repent for your part. It's okay. Maybe you weren't educated. It's all right. Maybe you didn't know. Whatever. Maybe you just were impulse and you did something. It's all right. Just let it go to God. Don't let the guilt and shame stay on you any longer. He wants to move you on in your future. We believe that this moment, God, you see it, and you're breaking off strongholds of slavery and fear to money in Jesus' name. And we all said, amen. Come on, give him a hand. Take your seats. Take your seats. Woo! Number two. So number one, he doesn't want you to owe anybody. All debt. That is the abundant life every Christian should have totally demolished number two Philippians 4 18 through 19 at the moment I have all I need and more I am generously supplied with the gifts there are sweet smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God and this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches which have been given up in Christ Jesus, Matthew 6, 31 through 33. So don't, uh, so don't worry about these things, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Number two, number one, you're coming out of debt. Number two, every one of your needs are going to be met. That means if you don't have enough clothes for your children, that is not God's will. That means if you don't have enough money to pay your rent over and over, that is not God's will. That means if you are in a place and your basic needs of life have not been met, I don't care what sins you've committed. I understand. I understand you could feel guilty and blame yourself all day. But God's will for an abundant life for every believer is that they are out of debt and that they have all their needs met because they're about his kingdom. This is not my opinion. I'm telling you what God says. Number three, Matthew 25, 37 through 40. So we got out of debt. We got all of our needs. Then these righteous ones will reply and say, Lord, whenever did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink or as a stranger show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? When did we say to you, to a sick person who were in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to the least of my brothers, you did it to me. Proverbs 19, 17. Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his deed. James 1, 27. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God means caring for orphans and widows. 
and distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. Number one, he wants you out of it. Number two, he's going to care for all your needs. You know what number three is? You're going to have enough to help the poor, the oppressed, the orphan, and the widow. Let me say it again. You should have enough that it will not break you in order when you see that person who is oppressed that you can give to them and you're not worried about your own needs because your needs have already been met. You should have enough. You can bless the poor, the orphan, and the widow. The oppressed, when you give it, the moment you want to, you got it. The moment you want to help that single mother in Walmart, you can pay for her groceries. The moment that you see that person there, you can do it. That is God's will that every single one of us would have enough that we can extend beyond our own needs and bless those who are in need. We're going levels now. Do you see this? Out of debt, all your needs. Now you're able to start helping poor and the oppressed. Let's keep going. Number four. This is so good. First Timothy 5, 3 through 4 and verse 8. Take care of any widow who has no one else to care for her. But if she has children or grandchildren, their first responsibility is to show godliness at home and repay their parents for taking care of them. <laughs> this is something that pleases God, but those who won't care for their own relatives, especially those in their own household, have denied the true faith. Such people are worse than unbelievers. You got to get out of debt. That's God's will. He wants all your needs to be met. Number three, he wants you to be able to help the poor, the oppressed. Number four, he wants you to have enough to be able to supply for your own children and your parents when they get old. Nobody ever talks about this in church. Your parents raised you and paid for things, most of them. But when they get older, you're supposed to pay for them. That's a godly thing. Some of y'all right now are like, what? It's in the Bible. This is for every person. It pleases God. He wants you to have enough to bless your own family and your parents. Nobody preaches this, but I'm going to preach it. Because the blessing of honoring your father and mother does not just come from respect. It comes from actual material needs. <laughs> Next one. Proverbs 13, 22 says this. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Could you please look up at that scripture? A good man or woman leaves an inheritance to their children's children. And the wealth of the sinner, listen to this, is stored up for the hands of the righteous. God has this corrupt money, this money that corrupt men and women have made. And you know what he does? He puts it in a separate bank account for whoever will be a believer who can say, what will you do with my money? I trust you with it. And he'll give it all to them. He literally has on hold finances and resources because he knows he can trust you that you won't build your own kingdom with it, but that you will pass it through your hands in order to build someone else. Do you notice that every single thing that I've said so far, none of it is about you having everything? Do you know what it is? All of it is about you going beyond yourself and blessing someone else. That's the Bible. The Bible gives it to you. All your needs will be met, but he gives it to you so you can be a blessing to others. Every part of it. So look, you need to have enough to have an inheritance, not just for your kids, your grandchildren. Listen to this, y'all. How great would it be when your daughter gets married or your husband and say, baby, I just want you to know we already got a house for you. We already got this car. And not only that, whenever you have children, their college is already all paid for. That's godly, y'all. It's godly. We should all want this. Last one, Deuteronomy 15, 5 through 6, and this is one of my favorites. You will receive this blessing if you are careful to obey all the commands of the Lord your God that I am giving you today. The Lord your God will bless you as he has promised. You will lend to many nations, but you will never need to borrow. You will rule many nations, and they will not rule over you. Listen to this, guys. 
God wants to give you enough that you're out of debt. God wants to bring you out of that. He wants to bring you out from under and he wants to put you above. The head and not the tail. Above and not beneath. He doesn't want you to be a slave to anything. But then he wants to bless all of your needs, you know, or supply. Then he wants to give you enough that if you see somebody oppressed or somebody poor, you have the power to help them. You have the power to be an answer. Then he wants you to be able to bless your entire family and your parents when they get older. Now he's saying, not only that, not only I want to do all that. He says, now I want you to know. That you're not just going to store up an inheritance. I want you to have enough that you can lend to many and never have to ask them to pay you back. You can have it. Oh, man, what, you bought us a car. I promise I'm going to pay you. No, don't worry about it, man. Take it. Just be blessed today. Take that. Just be blessed. Take that house. I got it for you. Take this new car. Single mom, you need a car? Just have it. Oh, I promise I'm going to. No, no, no. You don't got to give me anything back. God just loves you today, ma'am. I just want you to know that. Come on. You know what I'm saying is godly. You know what I'm saying is right. Don't let religion take this from you. Don't let religion take this from you about money. Don't let yourself get respond. Don't doubt this. You know this is God. God did not put you on the earth so that you could just blend in with the drama and the depression and the loneliness and the poverty. He put you to be an answer. Do you hear me? He put you to be an answer. Some of us got to get our faith up. Some of us have to reawaken. And as I've been saying in some of these, some of y'all's mind is just getting blown. Because you don't even know what it looks like for you to be in success. You've literally only known failure for so long. You don't even know what I'm talking about. You don't even know how to have faith for this. Let me tell you this. Let me encourage even you. A mustard seed is all you need today. The smallest amount of faith, God will work with it, I promise. If you'll just believe again, if you'll just believe this is God's will. I didn't make these up. I just read you the Bible. I didn't talk about how many cars I got. I didn't come up here showing you my bling. I'm just trying to tell you that God doesn't want you to stay oppressed and poor and in poverty. He died on a cross. He shed his blood. He became the fullness of all that so that you could be blessed. He took the curse so you wouldn't have to have a curse. He was pounded and wounded so that your wounds could get healed. He took all the sickness so that you could get health. He did it all. The cross is the reason. You might be like, well, you know, Gavin, I'm in one of those areas. I, you don't know the neighborhood I grew up in, and you don't know where I was at. It can't work for me. Well, let me just give you an example. How about Africa? Nigeria, Africa. The, the average income is about $15 to $25. And this group of Africans went out. It was a pastor and his wife and all these people, and they got around. They went out, and they found a field in Nigeria. This was years ago. And they went out and they said, you know what? I think God wants to give us this field. This is where we're going to build our church. So they began dancing all over the field. Hundreds of Africans just began dancing. Before they owned the field, they just were dancing on it. They just knew this is our church. By faith, they were just doing it. And they only had one goal that they all said within themselves that they would promise to. Is whatever God did from that moment on, they, number one, they would never borrow from anybody. They would never ask for a loan from anyone. And they would never, ever stop tithing. Every single one of them just proved that. They said, 100% of us will tithe. That's what they said. Now, look at what happens when a few hundred Africans in the middle of, they don't got no social security. They don't have food stamps. They got nothing. And they come out and they begin 100% tithe. Start showing those pictures behind. Canaan Land is the name of the campus of Winner's Chapel, an evangelical mega church in Nigeria. Canaan land is also Nigeria's largest Christian estate and it's owned. The 500 acre facility opened in 1999 and has since expanded to 5,000 acres, which it includes in itself Faith Tabernacle, Covenant University, Faith Academy, Secondary School, the Kingdom Heritage Nursing Primary School, several business ventures operated by the church are located within the complex, including a publishing house, a bottled water processing plant, a bakery, various restaurants and stores four banks several employees 2,000 church employees all have homes paid by the church 9,000 students are going to the college and university 50,000 people fit in the sanctuary per service it was built within 10 months without borrowing one dollar 
It is a 5,000 acre expanse. They have a farm that's 400 acres growing all the food. They're, they paid $230 million just to get the air conditioning running in the building. It was nothing. The city and everything about it was constructed by Nigerian companies. Not one single foreign company touched it. Own multiple aircraft so they can go to Haiti and re respond to missions all over the world. Own multiple cars, literally a whole lot of cars. It's like a car dealership where if there's a single mom or anybody, they just give them the car. Take it. Go, go, go. Take that car. Take it. Just on low all the time. And one offering that they did in their annual Shiloh conference, it took them over a year to count the offering because the offering was taken out by two semi-trucks. That all happens as a result of all people agreeing on one principle that if you will tithe and test me in this that i will open up the windows of heaven and i'll pour you out a blessing that you cannot take when 100 percent of people in a small african church in the middle of nowhere obey a principle let me tell you something there was a man named elijah and he didn't have nothing he didn't have a backpack he had nothing but because he obeyed god's voice and obeyed his principles the birds came and fed him in the midst of a desert let me tell you about 3.2 million people in the midst of a desert they had nothing but when they were thirsty god broke open a rock and poured them out an entire lake god would take them into nowhere when they got hot he put a cloud over their head so they could cool down. When they got cold, he said, oh, you're cold a little bit? Let me turn up the heat. And he put a pillar of fire. He said, your shoes they ain't never going to wear out. Those Air Jordans are going to look good for the next 40 years. They never got sick around animals and disgusting stuff. 40 years, nothing. God knows how to take care of his children. I said, God knows how to take care of you. But here's the deal. <laughs> Are you hearing me, Pomona? Are you hearing me, Arrowhead? Are you hearing me, campuses? Here's the deal. Africa, I see you. Here's the deal. He's not going to force you to have an abundant life. He's telling you it's for you. It's for you. Let me close with these last... Last thing right here, and then we're going to close. The Bible says later in Deuteronomy 15, 4 through 8, we're not going to read it. It says that because you have listened, he says, I'm going to make you a lender to many nations and not borrow. But then he says, what I want you to do is when you get this abundance, I want you to have a certain attitude. Because many of you are about to be attacked by this abundance. It's going to come to your house. Because you're about to dedicate to truly break off all fear and anxiety. And you're going to employ God to be your provider. I feel it. I feel it in the building. I have seen this happen to thousands of people over the last 20 years. I'm telling you this works. And what's about to happen is when you get it, you're going to have a deci decision. Are you going to get it and do this? Or are you going to get it like this? It's called the open hand. The power of the open hand. It means I don't tithe so I can get something from God. I tithe so that I can have it to give it. I don't try to give to God so I can get from God. I give to have to give. I am a resource of a funnel into being answers all over the world. First thing he's going to do is a lot of y'all are about to come out of debt. And I'm telling you by the end of the year, miraculous things are about to happen. Because you cannot be weighed down by this. Man, there's a strong anointing right now. But what happens is he's going to give it to you. And you're going to have to decide. The open hand. Let me tell you this. Isaiah 65, 23 through 24. There's an anointing for this, so i got to say this. They will not work in vain, and their children will not be doomed to misfortune. For they are people blessed by the Lord, and their children too will be blessed. Listen. I will answer them before they even call to me <laughs> while they are still talking about their needs i will go ahead of them and answer their prayers you see listen there is something that is going to unlock in some of your lives man the anointing is strong right now i would not miss this let your faith connect with this atmosphere there's something in this atmosphere things are breaking things are breaking over your family it's breaking over there stuff's going on right now i can literally hear it it's like things are snapping 
But there is a moment where God literally, all he's waiting for you to do is let go of what's in your hand because he's already had something in his hand that was ahead of you. What am I talking about? Do you remember that when we talked about time, how God's before it, he's outside of it, he's in every single moment, he's already ahead in your future. He's already there. Please understand something. God is already waiting. And the answer you need is like a couple hours away if you'll just trust him right now. Let me give you an example. The Bible says that Abraham was woken up one day and he said, you got to go sacrifice your son on the mountain. So what the heck? Abraham starts walking three day journey up to the mountain, but he doesn't understand. He's not the only person walking. Matter of fact, there was something else that was already on that mountain, but he had no idea what it was. So see, he's walking up that mountain and he's going through the pains. Lord, when are you going to change your mind? God, I know I heard wrong. Please, Lord. Like, but he's going in faith. He's just obeying because he's hoping he's not actually going to have to kill his son. But he's going up the mountain, and as he goes up the mountain, do you have that picture? Please put that mountain picture up if you got it. As he goes up the mountain, this is Mount, uh, Mount Moriah where he actually went. As he goes up the mountain on one side, on this side, there is this ram. This ram that is already crawling up the mountain. He can't see it because he's on this side. He's going up in faith, but he didn't know that that day before he woke up, there was already a ram that was caught in a thicket that was waiting for him on the top of the mountain. You see what I'm saying? There is something that if he just would trust God, you see, he can't see it, but the ram is right there. He can't see it, but the ram is right. The answer is already there, but he's just waiting. Would you trust me? Would you? I, I don't actually intend on killing your son, but you're not going to know it unless you trust me. So he released what's in his hand, and we all know the story. The moment he does it, stop. There's already a ram in the thicket, Abraham. He came up here a couple nights ago. You didn't know about it, and I didn't tell you because I want you to trust me. How about this story? I'll just, just real quick. That one morning, Jesus wakes up, and he walks out, and he's about to meet some centurions that day who are about to ask him and everybody, why don't you pay tithe? Why don't you pay the tax? And they're about to come to him and talk him all about tax and everything and do the whole deal. And Jesus responds. What does he say? He says, uh, Peter, uh, just uh, take a hook real quick. Don't even put bait on it. Go right over there. Put it in. The first fish you catch will have the coin in its mouth. Please understand what happened. Before Jesus woke up that morning, a fish was already swimming. <laughs> before he woke up that morning a fish was already making its way to that specific spot at that specific point of the lake why because before you even ask it i'm already meeting your answers so jesus walks up the centurion says, and it's so incredible. Can you see the timing and the spirit? Can you see how heaven is just anticipating this? They've already orchestrated it so beautiful because God's the greatest composer of all time. So he sits there and he says, listen, Jesus is walking and he sees the fish there and he's like, oh, it's about to be good right now. It's about to be good. The centurions, they ask their question perfectly on cue. They think that they're trying to challenge him and God's like, thank you for playing your part. You see, God will even use evil people to play their part to bless you. God will even use evil people to play their part to bless you. God of heaven. So that fish is there. He says, go ahead right there. Can you imagine? All he had to do was turn to the left. He didn't say go out and fish for some hours. He said, just go right there. That fish had to perfectly be in place before the question was even asked. Last one. Last one. I promise I'm going to end. <laughs> Moses comes to a place in the desert with the children of Israel. It's called the bitter waters of Marah. It says that Moses was there and the people are trying to drink and they're like, eh, we can't drink it. It's, it's bitter. So Moses looks to the side in the desert. This is the desert of Shur. Put that picture up of the desert, please. This is actually what Shur looks like. He looks to the side and he sees a tree. He pulls the tree out, throws it in the water. The water becomes sweet and everybody can drink. Listen to this. Listen. For a tree to grow to even two feet in the desert of shore, it takes an average of three years. For a seed, and there are so little seeds in the desert, as you can see, there's hardly any growth. But there was a seed around three years earlier while the... Oh, while the, wow, 
While the Israelites were still being beaten on their backs, there was a seed that started rolling. While the Israelites were still being whipped, there was a seed that started rolling. My God, while they were in the place under the taskmasters, God already had their breakthrough for them. He was already excited because he knew they were coming out. And that seed came three years earlier, planted, and it grew. And it didn't just grow up in any spot. It grew up in the exact spot because before you even ask, I know, and I'm answering your prayers. God is just saying... God is just saying, can you trust me? Do you have an open hand? I'm just asking for something small. You'll just give what's small in your hand right now. I've seen people within hours of giving something, within hours of surrendering something, within hours, they're literally blessed. We're, we're going to watch a testimony about two weeks from now. This woman, she gives. She never gave an offering before. She gives. By 2 o'clock that same day, an offering of five times the amount, a random person comes and says, God told me to write you this check. For the next day on Monday, she gets five times the amount. Tuesday, five times the amount. Three times, five times the amount. Her entire business comes out of debt in a week. Everybody's eyes closed, please. Everybody's eyes closed. God of heaven. Right now, we have been asking each other as a staff here at the church. We've been praying for you. We love you. And we've been asking and praying, what is it that we can be believing for you for? What is it we can believing, be believing God for for you? And we have decided as a staff, we said, man, we really believe God is on this. We're believing a thousand new breakthroughs and freedom. You see, prosperity is everything. It's mind, soul, and emotions. But especially, we're believing that there will be a thousand new breakthroughs of people out of debt, people financially released, and that you will no longer have anxiety and fear over your life. We're believing for a thousand. By the end of this series, we know there's going to be a breakthrough, and I'm telling you, it's going to happen, and God's going to exceed it. If you say, I am one of those people, I need a breakthrough in my resources, stand to your feet right now in this anointing. Stand up. Look at all these people. Look at all these people. Come on. This is a moment. This is a moment of breakthrough. Lift your hands in the air right now. There's a strong anointing that's in this place. Whew. I feel like anything could happen, guys. I feel like, the, like literally like there's a key in heaven. I, I feel it like the window is opening. Because the moment you get serious about God and believing what he says, listen, we are not waiting for him. He's been waiting for us. We're not waiting for him. He's been waiting for us. If you need that breakthrough, resources in your life, I'm talking out of debt. I'm talking believing that God's going to take anxiety and fear away. There are three steps to making this happen. Number one, you have to recognize it, that you need help. You all have done that right now. You all stood up recognizing this. You said, God, I've recognized this. I need this help. Number two, I'm going to agree with you right now that I will break the authority of this bondage over your life. We're going to agree. You have to, with your own mouth, come into agreement with this. It is biblical. You have to open your own mouth and say, I believe what you said. So we're going to pray right now, and then there's one last step. Here we go. Let's pray. Every eye closed. I'm praying over you. You don't have to repeat any of these words. In the name of Jesus, I just thank you, Lord God, right now, that there is an anointing to break yokes of bondage. I thank you, Jesus, that right now, financial anxiety and fear is leaving marriages. I thank you, Lord God. We didn't talk about all the things we could own. We talked about the blessing we could become. And I thank you they want to be that. I thank you that you're releasing stress. You're releasing anxiety. I thank you, God, that fear is gone. Jesus, I pray, Lord, that as we agree with you, and here's the part you have to participate in, if you have any part in this, repent of that. Just repent right now before God. He already knows it. He's not looking at you with shame. He's not looking at you with guilt. Just let it go right now. Let's move on. Come on, just repent. You have to confess it. Just let it go. Whatever your part was to play, God wants to move on with you. And that the breakthrough right now, whether it's a poverty curse, whether it has been in their family lines for generations, whatever it is, we release them right now in the name of Jesus Christ. You are freed in the name of Jesus Christ. Everyone look at me right now. Here's the last part. This is it. This is the final part. If you have said that, you recognized it. Number two, you have now confessed it with your mouth. Something is breaking. Number three, the way God delivers you is he lets you find a principle 
and the principle walks you out of bondage. Let me tell you again, you have to find a principle, then the principle walks you out of bondage. Here's the principle, Malachi 3.10. My God, have I seen this work in people's lives. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, so be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, what, look at what he's going to give you. I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great, you won't even have enough room to take it in. Look at what he says. Try it, exclamation point. Put me to the test. This side says this, and this is going to be found. Look in front of your pocket right now, the seat right in front of you. You'll see this in the pocket. Pull it out right now. Pull this card out right here in the front seat pocket, right in front of you. Because I trust God, look at what this says. Because I trust God, I choose to make a lifelong commitment to obey God's principle of giving tithes and offerings. Making God my provider from this day forward, I forsake all fear and anxiety about money. And I will live in the abundant life God has for me. Look, you sign it, you date it. You do not give this to us. This is none of our business. We are giving you this so you can put this on your refrigerator. You can put this in your mirror. And when you get tempted and the devil says that God will not provide for you, you look at this. You say, this is the day that everything changed for me. This is the day my business got out of debt. This is the day my family truly was changed because I have a principle that's walking me into freedom. Let me bless you right now in Jesus' precious holy name. I thank you, God, as they make this commitment, lifelong commitment. They are employing you as their provider. They will not worry. They will not be in fear. They will trust you. Let them feel what they're feeling in this moment, the faith, God, that's beginning to arise. Let them have that, God. It's not about a church. It's not about anybody. It's about freedom. It's about you are a good provider, and you want to give it to them in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord. Everybody's still standing. Eyes are still closed. Here's the last part. You might have said, Gavin, you know, I've been listening to you speak. Honest with you, Gavin, I, uh, I don't even know Jesus you're talking about, but man, do I want this. My God, do I want this. If that's you, wherever you're at right now, you say, man, you know, I just want to get started with the greatest provider of all time. I just want to be started with him. Nobody is moving in this place. I just want to be started with him. Say, Gavin, that's me. I want to receive Jesus. I'm not going to ask you any questions. I'm not going to embarrass you, but there is a powerful anointing for your soul. We love you. We care about you. Would you please walk out of your seat right now and say, I want to receive Jesus. Or if you're that person who says, I received him at one time, but I want to rededicate because I have not been serious. Walk out right now. Come on. Walk out right now. We're up here for you. I want to rededicate. I've not been serious about my relationship with God. Look at them. Here they come. Here they come. Here they come. We're not waiting. We're not waiting. This is your moment. This is your moment. Out there in Pomona, you guys take over. Have your own altar call. We love you guys so much. God is moving. Come on. Come on. Keep coming. All campuses, God bless you. Come on, come on. Still get my hand. They're still coming. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Right over here. You can come all the way over. All the way over. Whew. Okay, what we're going to do real quick is we're all about to pray a prayer. This prayer is washing you free from your sins. The blood of Jesus is good for you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. The blood of Jesus is good for your sins. God has seen it all. Trust me, there's nothing you can surprise him with. What's up, man? God bless, man. We are here, and we are so privileged to do this with you. So as we're about to pray, please say this from your own mouth, because it does matter that you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. Hey, come on. They're still coming up. Still coming up. Number two, just to tell you real quickly as well, this is not the final step. Make sure after you pray this prayer, become a disciple of Jesus. Get into holy warriors. Get with some men. Get with some women that are going to encourage you now. There might be people in your life that you have to disconnect from because they're not going to take you toward the Lord. They're going to take you away. God needs to become your boss. Become a true disciple of Jesus. So right now, all of us praying this prayer together, please, let's say out loud, Dear Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you. You're a good God. We need you. Lord, thank you for dying on the cross, raising from the dead, and healing me, forgiving me. I'm no longer guilty. I'm no longer guilty, but I am saved now by the blood of Jesus. Become my boss. 
take me from this step forward and I'm trusting you that you will help me from this step all the way along the way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, give him a hand. Welcome to the family, y'all. There's somebody in front of you that's going to pray with you now. Please don't leave, but we love you so much. Thank you again. Pastor Marco will be here preaching on Wednesday night, so please come back. We love you again, and God bless.